This lecture is about amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease. This is a neurodegenerative disorder that's going to target motor neurons, either upper motor neurons or lower motor neurons. Inevitably, both are going to die. We'll break down the name of this right now. So we have amyotrophic Trophic essentially meaning nurturing, myo meaning muscle, and a not. With this, with amyotrophic, that means we're, we're seeing the wasting of muscles, so a lack of muscle nurturing. The lateral aspect of it really deals with the corpuspinal tract in our spinal cord. So if we'll recall the rough location there. The corticospinal tract, at least the lateral portion, is going to run here. We also have an anterior portion that's going to run down in the anterior portion of the spinal cord. But certainly here. And so what we're going to see are lesions. That would be the sclerosis in the lateral portions of the spinal cord. So ALS. Uh, has a name that makes sense as long as you can break down the words there. In the first part we're going to talk about uh, the disease, what it looks like, uh, and, and, and what causes it. And, and then I want to have a little bit of review on um, the central dogma and RNA-based toxicity. So in ALS we see degeneration of motor neurons, both upper and lower. Which population gets affected first uh, is going to create different subtypes of ALS, but in all cases, we see degeneration of motor neurons throughout the central nervous system. So all of our movements um, are carried out by motor neurons. Just a quick review, the upper motor neurons are going to be found in the cortex, also the brain stem, and then lower motor neurons are found in the brain stem and the spinal cord. What makes an upper motor neuron an upper motor neuron is that it's not directly controlling the muscle. Upper motor neurons are going to indirectly control muscles by activating lower motor neurons. So it's always a two-step process at the very least. In order for us to get muscle, that is, con I'm sorry, in order for us to get movement, that is contraction of the muscle, We have to have the release of acetylcholine by our lower motor neuron. And for the body, that's going to be found in the spinal cord. For the head, that's going to be in the brain stem. So that's that cortical bulbar tract. In both cases, they're lower motor neurons because they directly communicate with muscles. In order to activate the lower motor neurons, we have to release some glutamate from an upper motor neuron. And for consciously directed movements, those are in the cortex. We have some non-consciously directed movements as well, and those are going to be carried out by um, upper motor neurons in the brain stem. And we'll talk about these tracks more next semester. But those are the neurons that are going to be stimulated by the cerebellum. So while we don't have conscious control over these uh, motor neurons, they do have powerful effects over our ability to move in a coordinated fashion. So here we can see uh, a gentleman with a vermal lesion in his cerebellum that's uh, pretty close to the midline there. And so what you can see is that his, his control over the core of his body, so his balance, is impaired. So the non-conscious um, activation of upper motor neurons in our brainstem by the cerebellum is lost. And so the automatic adjustments that are carried out as we move about our, our world are lost. So he has to try to consciously keep his balance and it's far more difficult to do. Of course, we also have the basal ganglia that we can't forget about. They're going to determine whether or not we allow activation of our upper motor neurons. So they're all going to act together. The targets in ALS are going to be these right here. So in, in Parkinson's disease, uh, Huntington's disease, and in many cases of dystonia, we're seeing degeneration in the basal ganglia. 
ALS, also a motor disorder, but in this case, now we're targeting the motor neurons themselves. The, the prevalence varies depending on the study. It's going to be somewhere between 2 to 10 per 100,000 that are affected by ALS. It's more common in uh, men than women. You can still see that there's an age-dependent onset. The older you get, uh, the, the more likely the disease is. So it's less likely to occur in younger people. And most cases are going to come on after the age of 40. There are some rare cases that have earlier onset, though. In the top graph there, you can see both the effect of age and sex. So the, the prevalence in men is higher than women across all age groups. And ALS is, a, is about twice uh, as common in whites compared to blacks. The risk factors um, are for the most part uh, going to be based on uh, just bad luck, I'd say. Because only 10% of ALS cases are inherited. So 90% of them are sporadic. And this is in line with what we've seen uh, with the exception of Huntington's disease. So in Alzheimer's disease, uh, Parkinson's disease, and, and the dystonias, these tend not to be inherited. Like Parkinson's disease, exposure to pesticides is going to increase uh, your risk. Unlike Parkinson's disease, smoking increases your risk. And that's what the, the bottom plot is showing us there. So the earlier uh, one smokes, the higher the risk of developing ALS. The clinical presentation is very much based on the loss of motor neurons, whether it's upper or lower. So what we need to see is the uh, wasting of muscles. And this should be painless because what's happening is the death of lower motor neurons. Now when lower motor neurons die off, they're no longer communicating with the muscle. And certainly you've probably heard uh, use it or lose it before. And this is true here. It's true for neurons. If they're not being used, they will be lost. It's true for muscles as well. So the lack of muscle activity then leads to the wasting of the muscle. Because of the loss of motor neurons, we're going to see difficulty with speech and swallowing. At some point in the disease, if this happens earlier, that's more suggestive of bulbar onset and a poorer prognosis. We'll also see uh, weakness and muscle wasting in the limbs as well. The order varies from case to case. In some cases, we have bulbar onset, and in other cases, uh, we have onset within the limbs. Because of the loss of lower motor neurons, muscles are going to waste away. They're also going to become uh, very stiff and spastic, so we're going to see a higher muscle tone. That's more common with the upper motor neuron lesions. With lower motor neuron lesions, we'll actually see a decrease in muscle tone. But across the board, what we're going to see is weakness. This is a universal symptom of ALS, muscle weakness. With upper motor neuron lesions, we're going to see an increase in tone. And the amplitude of reflexes with lower motor neuron lesions, we'll see the opposite. Decrease in tone and a decrease in the amplitude of reflexes. So there's a few different types that we need to talk about, depending on the location of these upper and lower motor neuron lesions. When we have wasting of upper motor neurons in the cortex and the associated cortical spinal tract, This is what we call primary lateral sclerosis. So when these are the first neurons targeted, primary lateral sclerosis. Again, the lateral sclerosis uh, refers to the wasting of the cortical spinal tract in the lateral portions of the spinal cord. On the other hand, if we see primary wasting in the lower motor neurons within the spinal cord, 
if these are the first targeted, this is going to be called progressive spinal muscular atrophy. All of these are going to be progressive. The spinal portion deals with the location, of course, in the spinal cord. We're dealing with lower motor neurons here. And that lower motor neuron loss is going to cause muscle atrophy. Now, whenever we're dealing with the brain stem as the initial target, so the lower motor neurons in the brain stem, uh, this can be caused, of course, by upper motor neurons that deal more with portions of the face. So when these and the cortical bulbar tract are affected, this is called pseudo-bulbar palsy because we're going to cause bulbar weakness, but it's not because of degeneration within the brainstem. It's above there. So this is going to be pseudo-bulbar palsy. Actual bulbar palsy is going to be caused by the wasting of lower motor neurons within the brainstem. So when these lower motor neurons are targeted, then it's bulbar. The upper motor neuron, pseudo-bulbar. No matter which population we're targeting first, we should see sparing of sensory function because ALS is a, a disease of motor neurons, both upper and motor, affecting brainstem and spinal cord function. And regardless of which population is affected first, all are going to experience some degree of degeneration because this is a progressive disorder, just like all neurodegenerative disorders that we've covered. It's a bigger question than just yeah, how are I mean, you doing. Uh, the first question is how are you doing fine, and the second question is how are you really doing? And that's a, a much longer conversation. It's weird because it seems like it's like a whole different person. It was only I, six months ago. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't that long ago. When you see yourself six months ago talking about ALS and about your friends and about how you're dealing with it, what do you what are you thinking when you see that now? Um I think how lucky that guy was at the time. So some things to notice there. Rapid progression. ALS is going to progress rapidly once to, once um, symptoms arise. There's about two to five years uh, left to live. So in that six month period, you can see wasting. He's he's noticeably uh, thinner there, and you'll notice the difference in his speech. Far more slurred after six months, and that's because of the progressive wasting of the motor neurons dedicated to controlling speech. Now I want to make sure we're clear on how to distinguish an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron lesion. And this has to do with the function of these different motor neurons. In all cases you're going to see weakness because our ability to control our muscles is lost. Upper motor neurons really have two jobs. Their first job is to stimulate the lower motor neuron. And this way we can control the muscle. But in order for us to actually carry out movements, the upper motor neurons have to also suppress reflexes. So there are spinal reflexes that are going to help prevent involuntary movements. And in order for an overt movement to take place, we have to suppress them. So whenever we see upper motor neuron lesions, we're going to see muscle weakness because we're unable to control our lower motor neurons. But we're also going to see an increase in reflexes. We'll see an increase in the amplitude of those reflexes because our lower motor neurons are still intact. So they can stimulate the muscle, and because they're not getting that input from upper motor neurons, they are far more sensitive to sensory feedback. So they're far more responsive to reflexes. We don't have our upper motor neurons to silence them, and in order to stay alive, they increase the strength of synapses from sensory neurons.
So what we see there is hyporeflexia. We'll see an example of that here. Then we're going to check his L4 on the left side. Quite hyperreflexive. S1. Okay, now we'll we'll be careful on this side. Okay, so L4. Okay, and look, we have some clonus in the leg. We can stop it by pushing on the Golgi tendon organ just above the knee. That's a significant sign of some sort of myelopathy going on or upper motor neuron lesion. So what we'll do here is we'll gently dorsiflex him, we'll check his S1, and it actually activates his L4. He's so hyperreflexive. He's unable to dorsiflex the big toe. He's unable to dorsiflex the foot against the tone there. And his inversion, eversion are about 2 plus over 5. Another very interesting finding, and we'll zoom in on this one, is that he has a very positive Hoffman's test. So I'd like you to relax your hand, okay? And what you do here is you hold the middle finger, you flick it, and observe the thumb and the index finger coming together. Now, part of nervous system development is suppressing certain reflexes. And that's, of course, carried out by upper motor neurons that are going to suppress reflexes. So we can see the reemergence of reflexes that we've suppressed throughout development, such as the Babinski sign, or we can see the emergence of abnormal reflexes because the lower motor neurons are now so sensitive to sensory feedback that new reflexes are created. Now these are fairly specific, these abnormal reflexes, but they're not very sensitive. So these alone aren't going to be useful for making diagnoses, but they are supportive. The spasticity that we see there and that, that increase in uh, reflex amplitude has everything to do just with homeostasis. Lower motor neurons want to stay alive, and when the strength of these synapses drops because they're lost, we have an upper motor neuron lesion, the strength of these synapses is going to increase. Compare this to a lower motor neuron lesion. What we have there is the inability to communicate with our muscles. Here we should see hyporeflexia. In both cases we're going to see weakness. The muscle will be weak because we can't stimulate it. We can't stimulate it with reflexes either whenever we lose our lower motor neurons. That's because they are the source of acetylcholine that drives contraction. Now when we see the loss of lower motor neurons, other motor neurons can try to re-innervate those muscles that have been de-innervated. And this might be what causes the fasciculations that you'll see with lower motor neuron lesions. So these involuntary muscle contractions that you see going on there are potentially caused by other motor neurons trying to re-innervate that muscle. So if we have a lower motor neuron that's spared, communicating with a nearby muscle fiber, it can branch over and try to reinnervate the deinnervated muscles. As the axon is trying to find its target, what it's going to do is spit out some acetylcholine until it finds the neuromuscular junction. Now, having fasciculations does not necessarily mean that you have lower motor neuron damage. These can be brought on by stress as well. So if you get a little involuntary flickering in your, your eyelid or something like that, that doesn't mean you have ALS. It just means maybe you need to relax a little bit. Now as opposed to an increase in muscle tone, of course what we're going to see is a decrease in muscle tone. So the commonality between upper and lower motor neuron lesions is that they both produce weakness. And it becomes difficult for us to control the muscle. With upper motor neuron lesions, then reflexes control the muscle. With lower motor neuron lesions, nothing controls the muscle. And that's where you're going to see far more pronounced muscle wasting with lower motor neuron lesions. So the, the hallmarks of ALS are going to include that muscle wasting. So if you'll look at A and B, that's just a, a, a cross-section of a muscle fiber from a normal mouse 
and then a mouse model of ALS. And you'll notice that the muscle fibers are wasting away. They're shrinking in size because of the loss of motor neurons. So rather than having nice big muscle fibers within that cross section, these start to de degenerate and shrink in size. And what you're left with are much smaller muscle fibers. So the muscle itself is going to waste away as the muscle fibers shrink. So that we end up with a myotrophy. This is going to affect motor neurons. We're going to spare our sensory neurons, so if you look, again, wild type mouse is on the left, the, the ALS model is on the right, so in A we're looking at normal ventral and dorsal roots. So they're, they're flipped, remember, dorsal root is going to be sensory, We got a dorsal root ganglion out here with the cell bodies. And then these will eventually come together with the ventral root to form that spinal nerve. Ventral is going to be motor, dorsal is going to be sensory. So we're looking at that section right here in those slices, and it's flipped upside down for whatever reason. So on top, you can see the ventral root. So if you look at the top of part A, all those little circles there are axons. So we have intact motor neurons. Down below in the dorsal root, you can see smaller axons because sensory neurons have smaller axons. But they're there. Compare that to the right, you'll see wasting exclusively in the ventral root. And down there in the dorsal root, our sensory fibers are still intact. So all these axons on the left, you can see absent in panel B there. As with other diseases that we've talked about, we see the accumulation of proteins uh, with, within motor neurons in this case. So those, those inclusion bodies, those protein aggregates, are a hallmark of a variety of neurodegenerative disorders, and ALS is no different. We also see the buildup of neurofilaments. Neurofilaments are the intermediate filaments that help keep our axons and dendrites in, uh, in a, a proper order. So they, they provide essentially the structural stability of the neurites. So you can think of your intermediate filaments uh, as essentially the rebar uh, of the cell. So they, they are very strong. Uh, filaments that help keep the axons and dendrites um, together. When we don't fill our axons and dendrites up with neural filaments, their structure uh, becomes compromised. So rather than having our neural filaments distributed where they should be, we'll see them kind of build up within the cell body. So a big ball of neural filaments. And this primarily occurs in motor neurons, and that's why they degenerate in ALS. The reactive gliosis that we see, I'm going to touch on in, a, in uh, I think, two slides. So we'll come back to that. Reactive gliosis is going to play a role here. And we see demyelination. And we see it in that lateral corticospinal tract. We don't see it in our posterior columns. Sensory function is spared. So we're not killing off our sensory neurons we're killing off upper and lower motor neurons. So compare the top to the bottom. How blue it is is just showing you how much myelin there is. We have age match control on top, ALS patient on the bottom. You'll notice posterior columns are obvious in the ALS patient in the lateral corticospinal tract, as well as that anterior corticospinal tract are degenerating. So we see it's far less blue in our corticospinal tracts. Whether it's controlling the limbs or the trunk, in both cases we're seeing degeneration. Because those axons are gone, so is the myelin. Now the, the disease mechanism for ALS likely involves the inability to properly make proteins and get them where they need to be. Uh, this is just like every other disease that we've talked about. 
So nothing new here, just a slightly different way of accomplishing that. The most common mutation that you find in ALS is in a gene for a protein called superoxide dismutase 1. This is an enzyme that helps break down free radicals. So it, it oxidizes free radicals uh, to ensure that they don't go and damage other parts of the cell. So an obvious mechanism is that these mutations impair the function of SOD1 so what SOD1 is going to do is break down our free radicals so they don't go damage the rest of the cell. And when you have those mutations in SOD1, the idea is that we're not breaking down free radicals and then they build up and they damage the cell. It doesn't seem to be the case. So look at the data on this slide here. Um, the axons can either be large or small. And remember, your motor axons tend to be larger, so when you see large, Read that as motor, small, sensory. <clears throat> the second column there would be the counts for wild-type mice. So about 730 uh, motor axons and 304 uh, sensory axons that they were counting in their uh, uh, dorsal and ventral roots there. Now step over one more column and you get the SOD1 mutant. G85R. So we've turned this G into an R. So we change one amino acid in SOD1. The thought is we maybe we break its function and now it's not breaking down free radicals. So maybe we have a loss of function here. And we certainly have a loss of motor neurons. We're dropping down from about 730 or so to 188. So we see the loss of motor neurons. This is good. It's an ALS model. We should see the loss of motor neurons. Now in the next two columns there, that you'll notice they have SOD plus minus and SOD minus minus. Mice, just like us, um, are, are, are diploid, uh, meaning they have two copies of, of every gene. This plus minus is telling you they only have one copy of SOD1 and the minus minus tells you zero copies. So when they knock out the endogenous SOD1, there's no effect. If it really is a loss of function, we should see this number dropping dramatically whenever we get rid of the normal SOD. But there's no effect. In the last column there, you'll notice they have human SOD1 added into the mouse. So they have the mutation, and what they've done is add in a whole bunch more SOD1. So if the mutation is impairing SOD1's function, when you overexpress the normal enzyme, this should rescue it. But you'll see no change. So the mutations in SOD1 have absolutely nothing to do with its normal function. We're not seeing a loss of function, we're seeing a gain of function. This mutation causes SOD1 to do something that it's not supposed to. In fact, mutations that spare the enzymatic function that have no impact on the amount of free radicals that it's able to um, that oxidize has no impact on toxicity. It's still toxic. So it has nothing to do with scavenging free radicals. But it has everything to do with impairing axonal transport. So what we're looking at here are some chymographs, or um, we're looking at uh, transport down the axon over time. So what they've done here is label mitochondria, because mitochondria are going to be shuttled up and down the axon. It's a convenient way to look at axonal transport. Now you're going to notice in these bars there, time is going down. So here's at the beginning, here's at the end. So each little row there is just one point in time. And so you'll see on top, let me try to redraw it somewhat close. Some of these lines are essentially vertical and that tells us there's no movement. Our soma is over here on the left and uh, going down the axon is going to be to the right. So here's our neuron here. And we're just imaging that axon over time. 
If we see vertical lines, no movement. If we see lines that kind of meander this way, that mitochondrion right there scooted down the axon in an anterograde fashion. So from the cell body to the terminal. You'll notice some of them are going to move the other way. This was retrograde. So here's an example of anterograde. And this would be retrograde, because it started off further away from the cell body and ended closer, so it's moving this direction. This piece here, this mitochondrion, started off near the cell body and ended further away. So some things don't move. Some things move forward, and some things move back. So we can then track a whole bunch of different particles, and what you probably care about is looking at the bar graphs down below. So we have control, we have uh, ex expression of wild type, SOD1, and then we have um, another ALS-associated mutation, G93A. For this, think of that as ALS in a mouse. So a SOD1 mutation that's going to cause ALS. So we find this in people, we make a mouse model of it. What you'll notice there, if you look in B, those blue bar graphs are just showing you how many mitochondria were moving. They either moved in the anterograde or retrograde fashion. Looking at the green and red plots, you can see that we primarily have a deficit in anterograde transport. So the ability to move stuff from the cell body down the axon. This is exactly what we saw in Alzheimer's disease. You should be thinking of tau right now impaired axonal transport. We don't make any proteins out here, we make them here in the cell body. So if we can't transport proteins down the axon, we don't replenish the proteins in our synapse, and if our synapses don't work, we don't work. A neuron without properly functioning synapses is not long for this world. Other mutations associated with ALS um, are going to involve gene expression as well. So there's your TDP43 protein, tons of fun to say. What this is going to do uh, is help move RNA out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. So when we make our RNA here, it has to have some way of getting out of the nucleus if we're going to turn it into protein. Some protein that's going to do stuff. So TDP 43 is one of those RNA shuttling proteins that's going to help move RNA out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Loss of function mutations in TDP43 means that we're not moving our RNA out of the nucleus as efficiently. We're not able to make proteins efficiently. And that ends just like it does every other time I bring this up. Then we have that C9 open reading frame 72. Here, we likely have an abnormality in how we're um, processing our RNA. And I'm going to get to this again at the end of this video. So we're going to come back to this. But this has everything to do with gene expression. Just like the other diseases that we've talked about. If neurons can't make the right proteins at the right time and get them to the right place, they die. Now I want to go back and revisit um, reactive gliosis here. <clears throat> so interestingly, these ALS-associated mutations can be expressed specifically in glial cells and still kill motor neurons. So it might not actually require that the motor neuron itself isn't working properly, but instead, just dysfunction in the glia alone can kill neurons. Because neurons really do very little to take care of themselves. They are reliant on glia to clean up their mess, provide them with glucose, and, and, and make sure that they don't work themselves to death. So they'll clean up neurotransmitters, they'll clean up uh, ions, they're going to support neuronal function. Whenever we have um, neuron loss, this can lead to reactive gliosis. 
So it could be that the glia themselves are causing the disease, or it could be that glial dysfunction just helps uh, promote the disease. So let's think about what, what's happening here. So whenever we have the, the loss of neurons, so if my neuron is degenerating, it is no more. Let's say it's falling apart. This is, of course, going to be detected by a nearby glio, and we're going to have to clean it up. Now, part of that cleanup involves undergoing reactive gliosis. And we can see reactive gliosis in ALS and mouse models of ALS. And that's what this image is showing us. What they're doing is staining for glial fibrillary acidic protein. This is an intermediate filament in astrocytes. The main thing that matters here is when we see an increase in the amount of GFAP, that tells us we have reactive gliosis. So when you look at GFAP levels there, look at panel G, so top left. Not a whole lot of staining here. Whenever we have an increase in GFAP, we see darkness. So compare that, compare panel G to I. So at the end stage, whenever we have motor symptoms, you'll notice that we have overt gliosis. Our astrocytes are reactive. Before we have symptoms, we see a very mild form. So look in panel H there. Somewhere between no gliosis and full-blown reactive gliosis. Panel J is just zooming in a bit so you can see in better detail. The area that they're highlighting in these pictures would be the anterior horns. So here's where we're zooming in. In ALS, so we'll put ALS on the right and we'll have control over here, we see a whole bunch of GFAP expression indicating that we have reactive gliosis. Now that doesn't sound so bad. This is a normal part of cleaning up the mess. It doesn't sound so bad until you look at the other aspects of astrocytic function, which is to clean up the mess. One of the ways that we clean up the mess is with glutamate transporters. Excitatory amino acid transporters. The excitatory amino acid that we're talking about here is, of course, glutamate. Now, hopefully you recall from lecture one that when we, when we knock out glutamate transporters, this leads to um, uh, rapid uh, death and seizure activity in mice. We need glutamate transporters to prevent neurons from killing themselves and the organism. So now what these stains are showing us is glutamate transporters. We'll show that one in purple here. You can see plenty of glutamate transporter staining all throughout the gray matter of the spinal cord in non-transgenic mice, of course. And when you compare that in panel A to panel D, E is just a zoom in of the anterior horn. If you look at panel D, what you'll notice is that the anterior horns are largely absent of those glutamate transporters. If the astrocytes aren't picking up glutamate, that, of course, is going to lead to excitotoxicity and death of neurons. The dorsal horn, just fine. This is a disease of motor neurons, not sensory neurons. So we're not seeing reactive gliosis. We still see the expression of glutamate transporters. It's lacking in the anterior horn, and that could certainly lead to motor neuron loss through excitotoxicity just like we've talked about in previous lectures. Once we have a diagnosis, once we have symptoms um, that, are, that are clinically significant, the disease continues to progress and invariably leads to respiratory failure. 
The typical window is two to five years. Some folks like Stephen Hawking are going to live far beyond that, but he's an outlier uh, in many respects. The treatment options aren't great. Uh, they are supportive. Respiratory aids, uh, computer-assisted uh, speech devices, and then rehab aids uh, to prevent contractures. Now I want to take a, a just a, a little bit of time here and review gene expression just so we all are reminded of the central dogma, RNA processing, and why double-stranded RNAs uh, would be so bad. So central dogma is we go from DNA to RNA to protein. And, and this is great. This is true. That is how we make proteins. Now, whenever we transcribe DNA into RNA, we don't make the final copy. We have to process that RNA a bit. Now, RNA processing is going to involve a couple of things here. Um, first of all, we're going to increase the stability of it by adding on what we call a 5' prime cap and then a 3' prime poly A tail. So just a whole bunch of uh, adenine nucleotides. Just slap uh, a few a dozen or a few hundred on the end there. So this way when, when we start degrading the RNA, the first thing to go is just useless crap. Just that poly A tail. So the first thing we do is increase stability. The, the next thing we do, we got to cut out the junk. So not every bit of this RNA is going to be turned into protein. Just the exons. The portions between them, the introns, are going to be cut out. This might seem like a waste, but what it does is increase the flexibility of what we can make. I'll make the introns purple here. Now we don't have to always use the same exons and the same introns. Sometimes we can switch it up. So in this case I took these three portions as the exon. That's not always the case. Some genes can have what we call alternative splicing where different exons will be included in the, kind of, uh, the final messenger RNA uh, other genes uh, might have uh, a thousand different copies that they can make. And this alternative splicing is really important for how our immune system functions. And that's the way that it can, it can create uh, so many variable antibodies, for example. Once we finally process our RNA, we're going to ship that on out of the nucleus. Remember, we have those, those RNA binding proteins that will that'll take it out, and then we'll translate it into protein and that's how you make a gene. But what this should tell us is that there's a whole bunch of proteins dedicated to working with the RNA. Now not every RNA is going to be messenger RNA. Some RNAs are what we call non-coding RNAs. <clears throat> One example of that would be micro RNAs. These are made from hairpins. Some RNA is going to fold up and create a hairpin. That hairpin has a long region of base pairing that looks terrible. And it looks kind of like a bobby pin, and there's usually one that sticks out. So this hairpin is going to get cut to create the micro RNA. You'll notice it's double-stranded RNA, and that double-stranded RNA is going to be used to then modify gene expression. So dicer is the protein that's going to cut this. So dicer is going to snip that hairpin and create microRNAs. The microRNA is then loaded into what we call the um, RNA-induced silencing complex, or RISC. Uh, and, and this is going to then take one half of that RNA as the template. And then it's going to go look for any gene that's complementary to this. Now our cells use microRNAs to determine which genes they express. So 
proper processing of microRNAs is fundamental for having accurate gene expression because we're going to use them to turn off genes. One of the things that we'll do is have the risk complex go find the RNA that's complementary to it. So let's say we have some messenger RNA here that would be turned into protein, but unfortunately it's complementary to that microRNA. So the risk complex binds it and destroys it or it binds it and holds it and prevents the ribosomes from translating it. The other thing that it's going to do is go back to the, back to the DNA. Uh, we'll, we'll take this route. We'll go back to the DNA and compact it so that it can't be read, turning off that gene at the level of the DNA. And the use of microRNAs is what allows our cells to have such great diversity in their phenotypes. And microRNAs are very important. Uh, for neurons to establish their unique niche. So I want to go through some data here just so um, you can have some idea of why we think that RNA-based toxicity exists. So here we're going to be looking at um, a polyglutamine disorder in fruit flies. And we use fruit flies because no one cares about them and uh, it's very easy to see neurodegeneration in them and they have quick generation times, but mostly because no one cares about them. So in this case, we're overexpressing polyglutamine in a gene called a taxin-3. And this is, is um, associated with uh, a group of disorders called the spinocerebellar ataxias. Here we see degeneration of neurons in the um, uh, spinal cord and cerebellum, leading to motor abnormalities. <clears throat> we're going to express polyglutamine in two different ways here. If you start up on the top left, you'll see the two constructs. So there's our ataxin-3 gene, and what we're doing is putting in polyglutamine. Now there's two ways of encoding glutamine. CAA is the codon that encodes glutamine, and so is CAG. Now this expansion is what causes polyglutamine disorders. So they have two different constructs. One is going to encode polyglutamine with your classic CAG 78 times. The other one is going to have CAA, CAG repeats 39 times. Both of these are going to give you polyglutamine with 78 glutamines. So we get the exact same protein, the only difference is in the RNA. The top right is showing you degeneration in the, the retina of the Drosophila. And you'll notice that middle column there the CAG repeat has noticeable degeneration. It should be nice and red. We should have uh, uh, plenty of our um, rhabdomeres within the omatidia, the little uh, functional units of the eye. Basically we're seeing the nervous tissue in the eye waste away. The less red it is, the more wasting. And this is quantified in the bottom left. So we, they have uh, seven rhabdomeres. Um, so seven little uh, nerve components within each functional unit. And when they count them, what they see is that with CAG repeats, very few of them have seven. Most of them have some degree of degeneration. And with the CAA, CAG repeats, those are the darker bars there, most of them still have seven. And when you look at the uh, flies that are still alive. So look at that panel E there. This is the survival curve of fruit flies. Fairly normal when they didn't do any uh, manipulations there. And then they have their two options. CAG repeats, quick death. CAA, CAG, so still polyglutamine, but not quite as lethal. So even though we have the same protein, the different RNA made a difference. You can see that here in a non-coding region of the gene. In this case, we're going to express CAG repeats in the untranslated region of RNA. Remember, not every part of RNA becomes protein. At the end of it, we have some region that we don't translate. It's called the untranslated region. And that's where they stuck their CAG. So now we're not making any polyglutamine at all. There is no polyglutamine. So what they do is take a red fluorescent protein, 
called DS red because it fluoresces red. And after the coding sequence, they then stick in their CAGs. And they put in 100 or 200 repeats. Doesn't really matter. But now they have their poly CAG. This is not polyglutamine, though. So take a look at panel B there. This is a Western blot. So it's showing you the size of the protein. Its size is related to how far down it migrates. And no matter how many CAGs they put in that untranslated region, DS red is the exact same size. If it were bigger, you'd see that line shift upward because it can't move quite as far down the gel because it's too big. So same size. In other words, their setup is fine. The untranslated region is indeed untranslated. It won't make it into the protein, yet it still causes neurotoxicity. So in panel D and E, so look down there at the bottom left, wherever that ends up in the video, panel D is showing us with CAG. Panel E is showing us without. Now, you're probably not expert at looking at a fruit fly brain, and that's fine. Uh, neither am I. Panel E, we don't see a bunch of big holes. Panel D, where we have our untranslated CAG, we see a bunch of holes. So we see death of nervous tissue, and it has nothing to do with the protein. Now, why is that? It has to do with the RNA structure. So, if you uh, look at how this RNA is expected to fold up, your CAG repeats. Those are going to make a hairpin. A hairpin that shouldn't exist. CAACAG instead makes a whole bunch of bubbles. Something that doesn't look like a hairpin. And this brings us back to our G, 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 C, C repeat in that C9 open reading frame 72. Why does that cause neurodegeneration in ALS? Because it makes a hairpin. G, 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 C, C can base pair well enough to make a hairpin. So you'll see right there in the middle that looks very much like double-stranded RNA, just like CAG repeats, but very much unlike the CAA, CAG repeats. So when we make these hairpins, what we're doing is making mutant microRNAs. This is, of course, recognized by Dicer. Dicer cuts it up, says this looks like a hairpin. We create our microRNA, load it into RISC, and we use it as a template. So we got CAG over and over and over, and what we're looking for is the complement of that. CTG doesn't exist. So now, the risk complex has been sent on a mission it can never fulfill. The normal microRNAs that need to be expressed in that cell and used to regulate gene expression don't get processed. We miss important hairpins, we don't make microRNAs, and we don't properly express our genes. Without proper gene expression, neurons die. So that's the idea behind RNA-based toxicity. I have a few review questions for you here. If you have any questions on these or anything else, let me know through the class website, and we'll address them in class. See you later.